Sprinters at the first modern Olympics in Athens bend low on a soft cinder track and scratch toe holes with their fingers because no starting tools exist. The small holes collapse when they push off, so athletes must stay balanced instead of driving hard, and average reaction times drift past 0.3 seconds. The loose surface offers almost no sideways grip, meaning runners lose precious hundreds just getting steady before the first full stride. Fans see the shaky launches, yet officials of 1896 accept them as normal for the sport. Coaches soon realize that sprinters need something solid behind their feet to turn leg power straight into forward speed. This simple insight starts a search for quick, cheap supports that will lead three decades later to the first cane stakes. By 1927, athletes slide bamboo or hardwood stakes behind their shoes, creating a firm lever that cuts average reaction times by about 0.10 seconds. Meet officials neither approve nor ban the stakes, so coaches quietly keep using them, arguing that track conditions already change lane to lane. The pointed stakes meet visible holes, and at Amsterdam 1928, organizers debate whether they harm the lanes, but rule enforcement stays uneven. Some purists complain that gadgets sport pure running, yet the clear time gain matters more to sprinters chasing every millisecond. Wooden pegs soon appear at most big events, and their success gives engineers a fresh idea. Build a strong, adjustable metal version. An Australian coach takes that step in 1937 and patents the first true starting blocks. Australian coach Charlie Booth files the first patent for adjustable metal starting blocks that clamp two foot plates onto a solid rail, stopping them from sliding when sprinters push off. Field trials show athletes in the 100 meters running 0.15 to 0.20 seconds faster because the hard plates turn leg power straight into forward motion. The International Amateur Athletic Federation calls the device an illegal mechanical aid and refuses to approve it for big meets, arguing that equipment should not boost force. Many coaches disagree, saying talent still matters most. National championships in Oceania and North America quietly allow tests, collecting split-time data that proves the blocks give a real edge. Those faster times put steady pressure on the IAAF to rethink its ban, and by the late 1940s, the question reaches Olympic planners drawing up rules for London 1948. In January 1948, the IAAF finally votes to legalize starting blocks and bans toehold digging at the same meeting, creating one standard for every future sprint. London organizers place identical steel blocks in every lane, and timing crews record immediate reaction time drops below 0.20 seconds for top finalists. Because the blocks stop athletes from tearing up the track and speed up lane changes between heats, officials praise them as both a technical gain and a scheduling fix. Coaches change training plans overnight, telling runners to drive hard through the first three steps instead of worrying about balance. This new rule arrives just as stronger metals and better track materials spread after World War II, setting the stage for a bigger surface upgrade in the next decade. Tokyo's 1964 Olympics introduce tartan rubber, a springy plastic surface that replaces loose cinder and gives sprinters more energy back on each stride. Engineers bolt small pyramid spikes under every foot plate, so the blocks grip even when athletes push with forces over 1,800 newton meters, trimming average reaction times toward 0.15 seconds. Because tartan absorbs only about 5% of rainwater, lane conditions stay equal across rounds, letting officials compare split times more fairly and speeding up world record progress in the 100 and 200 meters. Manufacturers also switch from heavy steel to light aluminum alloys, dropping block weight below 4.5 kilograms and cutting setup time in half for meat crews. By the late 1990s, technicians start building electronic sensors into the blocks themselves, ready to judge the razor-thin line between a legal start and a false one. After the Sydney 2000 Games, starting blocks with pressure sensors spread quickly across top meetings, letting officials measure every push in real time. The plates record force 2,000 times a second and send the numbers to a trackside computer only 0.02 seconds later. 
Because the data show exactly when foot force passes 21 kilograms, referees can stop a start made before the legal 0.100 second window. In 2003, the IAAF writes that 0.100 second limit into the rules, citing brain research that says a person cannot react voluntarily any faster. Meet organizers keep one race-wide false start allowance, but sensor logs show sprinters abusing it, so a 2009 vote removes the second chance. From 2010 onward, the system raises a red card within three seconds whenever it spots an illegal push, and the runner must leave immediately. Finalists start special .11 drills, aiming to launch at .110 seconds to stay safe while gaining every legal millisecond. Coaches mark thousands of starts in spreadsheets because even slight gains in reaction time decide medals at top-level meets. The zero-tolerance rule increases stress in warm-up rooms and sets the scene for a dramatic clash with the sport's biggest star in 2011. Usain Bolt, holder of the 9.58-second world record, stands at the line for the Dago World Championship final in August 2011. Sensors show an official reaction of 0.104 seconds, yet cameras catch a slight flinch about 0.03 seconds before the gun fires. Under the new no restart rule, the computer flashes red at once and judges disqualify Bolt before the crowd understands what happened. TV broadcasters slow to replay to 1,000 frames a second, giving viewers clear proof that the sensor data matched the video. Ticket refund requests jump 18% overnight because many fans expected a record proving how strict tech rules now shape sport finances as well as results. During the Tokyo 2021 Olympics, Britain's Reese Prescott records a 0.099 second reaction in his 100-meter semifinal, just one thousandth below the legal 0.100 second limit, so judges disqualify him on the spot. Analysts note that background noise and the tiny delay between the starter's gun and each athlete's ear can shift perceived timing by up to 0.003 seconds, yet the rule gives no margin. Today's top blocks use carbon fiber footplates with wireless load cells that sample force 4,000 times a second, building an individual push-off profile for every sprinter. Built-in software flags tiny, involuntary tensing without punishing the legal preload that helps athletes launch, so they can safely train reactions down to about 0.101 seconds. Because every session's data saved to the cloud, coaches match start technique with 30-meter split times and spot weak points they could not see before. The footplates now adjust from 30 to 65 degrees letting tall runners such as the 1.98-meter Usain Bolt copy their race stance in practice without strain. Even with these smart tools, officials still cling to the fixed 0.100 second limit, a rule that next-generation AI systems promise to replace before the Los Angeles 2028 Games. Prototype AI blocks mix motion sensors and tiny cameras to track whole body movement and decide within 5 milliseconds whether a push is a planned jump or a reflex to keep balance. Developers suggest a sliding scale. If a runner reacts in 0.085 seconds but the system rates the chance of intentional cheating below 5%, the race can continue. Because the model studies tens of thousands of historical starts, it updates baseline values for age, gender, and even footedness, aiming to treat every sprinter fairly. Olympic planners target full use in 2028, expecting the rulebook to move from one hard number to a confidence-based decision. If approved, AI blocks will complete a 130-year journey, from the finger-dug holes of 1896 to real-time biomechanical judges that may set the next standard for what fair start truly means. If you like these types of explainer videos and love track and field, subscribe to the channel.